Today we're going to be talking about concepts of a differential diagnosis for hypoventilation. That's a broad differential diagnosis and one that relates to uh, the basic formulas used to determine the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And so let's start with that relationship. Basically what we know is that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveolus which is very similar to the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial system, is proportional to the amount of carbon dioxide that we produce in the metabolism of carbohydrates. Divided by the alveolar ventilation. This is a critical relationship Let's talk through it real quickly. The more carbon dioxide the body produces through the metabolism of carbohydrates, the higher the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. However, as we increase our alveolar ventilation, and we can do that either by increasing our respiratory rate, frequency of our breathing, or the tidal volume which means the amount of uh, volume of air that we exchange in a breath. So typically that might be 500 cc's if we take a deeper breath, uh, then we may increase that tidal volume. And we may increase either. Um, that would increase our alveolar ventilation. The higher the alveolar ventilation, the lower the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is in uh, the alveolus or the arterial system because we're eliminating more from the body that is being produced. So these are the two key factors that, that will play a role in carbon dioxide uh, uh, balance in the body. And so anytime that we have a increase in the amount of carbon dioxide in the body, we call that hypoventilation. And that is a high PaCO2. So let's look at a new page here. So now if we think about different causes for this, let's start with some of the general causes that would give us sorry, a low alveolar ventilation. Well, to do that we have to think about what things control ventilation. And we know that ventilation is controlled in the brain, particularly in the medulla. So this one we're going to call number one, and this is called CNS causes of hypoventilation, central nervous system causes, or central hypoventilation. And some of the key features of central hypoventilation, or some of the key causes, are medications such as opiates. This is th these are things like hydromorphone, morphine, oxycodone, or heroin. In addition, any other thing that impacts the medulla, such as a stroke or seizure in that particular area, can impact the alveolar ventilation. And there are some additional, more rare causes of central hypoventilation that I won't discuss right now. The bottom line is if your drive to increase ventilation or to maintain ventilation is diminished, then you will have a low alveolar ventilation and your carbon dioxide value will rise. The next cause that we'll talk about, if we follow the central nervous system down to uh, the uh, spinal cord and the peripheral nerves, is something that I like to call neuromuscular, I'm going to abbreviate that as NM, hypoventilation. So neuromuscular hypoventilation is essentially uh, thinking about how we get from the spinal cord to the diaphragm, which is the large muscle that controls respiration. And so the first thing we think about is C345, which is uh, what 
is found in the phrenic nerve, which supplies the diaphragm. So any injury to the phrenic nerve through trauma or other uh, medical conditions can lead to a uh, lack of supply or a lack of neuromuscular control of the, the diaphragm. And if the diaphragm isn't functioning properly, you will have a low alveolar ventilation. In addition, if there is a problem prior to the phrenic nerve in the anterior horn cells uh, that control motor function um, of the diaphragm, such as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease, or myasthenia gravis or Guillain-Barre syndrome, these things can also impact the diaphragm and lead to a hypoventilation state. There are some other medications, obviously, that can um, impact the diaphragm function and other diseases that can impact diaphragmatic function. We're going to leave it at this for now. The next thing I would look at is the alveolus itself. So if the alveolus is filled with blood, pus, or other fluid, uh, then that will impair the ability of carbon dioxide to diffuse across the alveolar membrane and be, be uh, eliminated from the body. So this are things like pneumonia, uh, pulmonary edema, or pulmonary hemorrhage, for instance. The next category of things I start to think about is what's going to impact carbon dioxide getting from the lungs out the mouth, out the body. And uh, in addition to sort of neuromuscular causes, there are some other aspects related to the chest wall. So we call these restrictive hypoventilation. And anything that impacts the chest wall, such as obesity, so again, imagine that you have uh, a very obese uh, person whose abdomen actually pushes up on the chest wall and prevents it from expanding properly. Well, then your alveolar ventilation is, is going to be low, and therefore you uh, will have a high CO2 and have hypoventilation. In addition, um, you can have other types of uh, disease like scoliosis that's severe or other chest wall trauma uh, such as rib fractures or, or things along those lines that may cause restrictive hypoventilation. Another category is obstructive hypoventilation. And this just means there is an obstruction to airflow out of the lungs, and that can be obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA. So someone who's obese who has a large uh, tongue or extra mass around the neck uh, will, uh, when sleeping, may not be able to keep the airway open and therefore carbon dioxide will build up um, during those periods of obstruction. You can also have a foreign body that obstructs the airway and that can also lead to obstructive hypoventilation, again, an inability to clear that carbon dioxide. In addition, things like uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and exacerbation or asthma and exacerbation can cause this obstructive hypoventilation uh, preventing carbon dioxide from being eliminated from the body. The last category that we haven't discussed, which is one of the fascinating ones, um, are the categories where you have an increased production of carbon dioxide. And it's pretty rare for uh, a human with normal lung function and normal chest wall function, normal nervous system function, uh, to have a problem related to increased consumption of carbohydrates. Hey, we all have up those days. So if you have an increased consumption of carbohydrates, all you're going to do is increase your alveolar ventilation to be able to get rid of the extra carbon dioxide that you've just produced. However, if you're in a situation where you have, let's say, obesity, and you have restrictive hypoventilation, meaning you can't expand your lungs, uh, your chest wall any further, um, and you have a binge on carbohydrates, then uh, you can therefore put yourself into a relative hypoventilation state where the carbon dioxide level rises and you have no way to accommodate for that. And that one I call overeating 
hypoventilation. And this is pretty rare. Um, again, the two cases where you might see this are in, the, the, in someone who has one of these other problems related to a low alveolar ventilation and then also has uh, binging on, on carbohydrates. Uh, however, you can also see this in ventilated patients um, and who may be at the limits of what the ventilator can do to allow them to eliminate carb carbon dioxide and they may be on a high carbohydrate diet through tube feeding. And so it's important to keep that in mind um, in the uh, patient who's uh, in the critical care setting. So just to review, um, as we've said, there's uh, this relationship of PaCO2 to the production of carbo carbon dioxide in the body related to carbohydrate metabolism and the alveolar ventilation. And there are st so six big categories of things to consider in any patient that you identify with an elevated carbon dioxide um, because all of these things may be playing a role. I welcome your questions on the subject. Thank you very much.